I want to invite you to uh, open your Bibles with me to the Gospel of John. Uh, we're going to be in chapter 2 still today. Um, this morning, uh, Bree and Pete uh, are at home. Pete's not feeling super great. Uh, this last week, the, the poor kid got the infamous uh, baby's diaper rash, uh, which is oh so normal. Uh, you know, when he gets older, if he ever watches or hears the story, he might hate me for this, but whatever. Um, yeah, so poor kid's not feeling great, and uh, it continued to get worse and worse throughout the week, and so uh, we had taken him into his doctor and just to see if there was anything else going on, and they, they figured that he may have uh, some sort of something else going on, so they prescribed an ointment for him, and so we were like, great, you know, the kid's going to start feeling better. We got excited, um, started using this ointment for the kid, and a few days goes by, not getting better, as a matter of fact, getting worse. Uh, so started to raise some red flags. Uh, we were a little concerned. So yesterday, I uh, called uh, the doctor on call, and they said, you know what, you should take him in just to see, uh, just to make sure it's not some sort of something more serious. Um, and so uh, we did that, and the doctor said, okay, you know, we still think it's, this is what it is. And so they prescribed a stronger ointment and an additional steroid cream. They're like, hey, great. If this doesn't work, this might. Why do I share all this with you? Because this is a little weird, right? Why would the pastor get up and share about what's going on with his kid? The point in what I'm trying to get to, and I think it fits with uh, where we're at in some ways with our passage today, is that the doctors originally prescribed something that wasn't the cure, per se, for what was going on with my son. Eventually, they prescribe something else that we're hoping is actually going to take care of it, right? When we look at John's gospel today in our passage, uh, starting in verse 13, what we can be tempted to do is look at uh, this passage, and we may come up with a prescription for it, for the issues that are taking place, that may not be altogether bad. It may address things that are really going on, but they won't get to the heart of what's really taking place. And so as we open to this passage, I hope that today we will kind of be able to look past the uh, okay prescription and get into the heart of what really is going on here and what we really need to be addressing. Uh, Our passage, if you'd open with me, we're going to read it together. It says that the Passover of the Jews was at hand and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. In the temple he found those who were selling oxen and sheep and pigeons and the money changers sitting there. And making a whip of cords, he drove them all out of the temple with the sheep and the oxen. And he poured out the coins of the money changers, and he overturned their tables. And he told those who sold the pigeons, take things away, take these things away. Do not make my father's house a house of trade. And so his disciples remembered what was written, zeal for your house will consume me. And so the Jews said to him, what sign do you show us for doing these things? And Jesus answered them, Destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. The Jews said, It's taken 46 years to build this temple, and you'll raise it up in three days. But he was speaking about the temple of his body. When therefore he was raised from the dead, his disciples remembered that he had said this, and they believed the scripture and the word that Jesus had spoken. Now when he was in Jerusalem at the Passover feast, many believed in his name But they saw, when they saw the signs that he was doing. But Jesus, on his part, did not entrust himself to them because he knew all people and needed no one to bear witness about man, for he himself knew what was in man. Heavenly Father, as we open this passage today, as we begin this time where we uh, unpack this thing, Lord, we ask your blessing on it. Uh, Father, I ask your blessing on the the preaching of your word, that it be true to the scriptures, that it be true to the heart of what uh, John's gospel is teaching, proclaiming. Father, I pray that you would uh, open our hearts to these things, that we wouldn't be uh, so familiar with these stories, so familiar with this story even, that we would gloss over it, Uh, Lord, but that maybe we would even learn something. We would uh, grow in our awe and wonder of who you are, our appreciation of our Savior in this time. Lord, we ask you to be glorified and lifted up in all things. It's in Christ's name. Amen. As we approach this scene in Jesus' ministry, we have to question 
the intent of John's recording it. Is the purpose of this story uh, meant for us to bring a prescription to how we are to deal with and act with a place of worship, a, a building of worship? They have the temple, we have a church building today. Is that why John uh, uses this story, that we wouldn't turn the church building into a place of commerce and trade? Uh, or is John using this passage more descriptively uh, to reveal something about who Jesus is and what he's doing? I think that's probably the direction John's going. And that's where I use that opening illustration, the story of what's going on with my son right now, to, to give us some glimpse into this. Because is it wrong that we want to keep these places as sacred and holy, focused on worship of God? No. But is John telling this story solely for that purpose, that we would walk away from a study of this passage and say that a church context, a building in which people will come to worship is not to be mistreated. I think that is a value in what John is communicating, but not the primary focal point. And a couple of the reasons that I come to that conclusion is because if we were to look at how John focuses his, his attention, how he draws the things out of this story, as we look at Jesus as he uh, focuses on what transpires at the temple, uh, those things don't seem to rise to the surface right away. But John, especially as he kind of concludes this, gives us a different picture of what's really going on. You'll notice nowhere in this passage does Jesus ever make specific reference to the corrupt practices that may have been going on there in the temple? He doesn't uh, condemn the Levites for bringing all these other people in and saying, you're just doing things in a corrupt way. Do this in a, in a better way. Jesus just gets them out of there. He seems more concerned about where things are happening than exactly what is happening. As, and hopefully we'll be able to see that kind of unfold as we work through this. Now, uh, we believe that, and scholars believe that, yeah, there probably was a, a great deal of corruption. You probably talked about it in your small groups this week, uh, that as they were doing these things, yeah, there were markups on stuff. There was corruption uh, in terms of what animals could be used, making it so that people had to buy uh, when they would come here. But these, this trading, if you were, began really as a service to the people, to the Jewish people who had been pilgriming to Jerusalem for the Passover. Imagine uh, traveling quite some way to come and to, to celebrate the Passover feast in Jerusalem at the temple. And perhaps you didn't have an animal that you could bring for your sacrifice. Or perhaps because of how far or where you were traveling from, you weren't able to bring one with you. It would have provided a means for them to be able to come and to worship and to participate in the Passover. But yeah, there probably was some corruption. That's what happens when man takes things over, doesn't it? Uh, we tend to kind of manipulate things uh, for our gain. And so Jesus enters the temple here and sees what's going on. And I think his heart is more for the sacredness of worship, the sacredness of what's happening. So herein lies the problem, I think, as Jesus sees it, the problem being the focus of the temple, not just the function of the temple. To better understand it, I think we need to stop and look at the purpose of what the temple held for the people of Jewish backgrounds. Why was the temple so significant for them? Why did this place matter we live in a day and age where there's church buildings all over the place. There's multiple here in Shabana and the surrounding communities. You'll find church buildings in plethora. There was one temple uh, for the Jews to come and worship. Why was that place significant? Number one, it was significant to them because it was the place of worship. Right? It, that was the place that God had instructed his people to worship him, to conduct their spiritual dealings. The requirements and guidelines of the Old Testament worship would, through the Old Covenant were full of meaning. We talked about a lot of this in our study through Hebrews, right? That as they would come and perform these sacrifices in these sacred places, these, these things were meant to convey to God's people the holiness of their God. That as they come, they don't come on their terms. You come to God on His terms. 
He gets to dictate how we're to worship him. That's why there were such strict uh, requirements for the sacrifices. That's why God set apart a specific place uh, for them to come. And in that specific place, there were requirements on who could come into different areas of that temple, different areas of the tabernacle to worship. And there were requirements for them to do so. You couldn't just come willy-nilly to worship God. And so for the Jewish people, this place had become the place to come and worship. But secondly, and significantly, the temple became a symbol of God's dwelling with his people. It was the place where heaven met earth, if you will, where God would come and dwell. In 1 Kings uh, chapter 8, we're given a glimpse into the scene. And, And we read it in words, and I think if we were to try to picture what's going on here, we would be a bit awestruck. But in, in 1 Kings chapter 8, Solomon has constructed the new temple, and they're bringing the Ark of the Covenant into this new temple. And as he does it, he, he says this, that when the priests came out of the holy place, a cloud filled the house of the Lord so that the priests could not stand to minister because of the cloud, for the glory of the Lord filled the house of the Lord. There was a most holy place where God would come. That was the place where he would meet with his people. And only the high priest, the mediator for the nation of Israel, could go in. So this place would have held a sacred meaning to the Jews. This is the place where God dwells with us. This is the place where God comes And as such, that is the very place where the Jews had unique access to God. It was at the temple that they would receive access to the Lord through sacrifice. It was at the temple that they would have their spiritual dealings dealt with by the priests so that they could have right standing with God, that their sins could be dealt with and covered by the sacrifice of an animal. And I think this is why Jesus has issue with what's going on because what has been taken as a place of worship a place of significance has been demeaned to a place of trade so basically what's happening here is we're seeing that the jews and with the permission of the levites they've turned god's place into a place of irreverence there was an irreverence for god's house in the temple these things were happening I appreciate how Matt Carter puts it. He says that this house was built to display God's glory, but the sounds of confession had been replaced with the sounds of commerce. Gone are silent prayers to God. They've been exchanged for the angry chorus of men haggling over the price of bulls and sheep. The cooking of doves and the stink of manure now occupy the place that used to be reserved for men to humble themselves and worship God. Jesus levels a charge, but the charge is not unethical practices. They have twisted the purpose or the focus of the temple. Jesus is denouncing impure worship. And how practical is that for us today? to manipulate worship into something altogether impure, to manipulate worship into something that is focused on the conveniences and needs of man rather than focused on the Lord. That as we come and we gather in this place, that we would do things with him as the focus, that we would prepare our hearts and our minds to come to the house of God, uh, not for our own conveniences, but to worship him, to worship God. That's what this is all about. And here man had perverted the focus of the temple and that got to the heart of our Savior. That he would see that taking place, this perversion, this irreverence of the house of God, uh, recognizing fully what it was and, and just totally degrading that and making it something altogether different. Jesus' heart is for the purity of worship. And we'll see this kind of continue to unfold over the next few weeks as we see more interactions at the outset of Jesus' ministry. But what we're uh, continuing to see in this particular passage is not only was there the irreverence, but because of their irreverence, they had actually created an inaccessibility for people to worship. 
It's nearly universally believed that where this was taking place, this wasn't going on in the holy place. This wasn't taking place uh, in the most holy place. This was taking place in the court of the Gentiles. Now, to give you uh, a snapshot of this, uh, we, in, the, in the temple, there were different courts. You had the court of the Gentiles, which all people were welcome to come into. Then you'd have the court of the, the Israelite women, and then the court of the Israelite men. And you were not allowed to go past your court. And so if you were not a Jewish person, you could not go beyond the court of the Gentiles. And so what's happening here is they've transformed this court of the Gentiles into this place of trade, which we'll just leave it to this. Some commentators would say that if this were happening outside the temple, perhaps, perhaps Jesus wouldn't have had anything to say about it. But here it is happening in the temple, creating an impossibility for the Gentiles to come and to worship God. The one place of the temple that they were allowed to come and offer their prayers of petition, their, their voices of praise and honor to God, has now been consumed with all of this other stuff going on. It had become inaccessible for them to come and sing praises to God. Back in uh, Isaiah 56, they, they speak of the court of the Gentiles or even the focus of the temple this way. It says, And the foreigners who join themselves to the Lord to minister to him, to love the name of the Lord and to be his servants, everyone who keeps the Sabbath and does not profane it and holds fast my covenant. Everyone who holds fast my covenant. He says, these I will bring to my holy mountain and I will make them joyful in my house of prayer. Their burnt offerings, their sacrifices will be accepted on my altar. For my house shall be called a house of prayer for all peoples. And the Lord God who gathers the outcasts of Israel declares, I will gather yet others to him beside those who already gathered. The temple was to be a place of prayer for all the peoples. And while it may seem unfair or unjust in the culture that we live in today, that there would have been separate courts for separate people, it was a true grace of God to welcome even the Gentiles to come and worship him. The Jews being his chosen people, and yet he welcomes the nations, the peoples, to come. And so it's in view of these problems that we see Jesus come and he takes action. It's because of this perspective on things that Jesus comes in and he drives out with a whip all that's taking place. And I, I'd like to encourage you, imagine for a second being Jesus' early followers. A couple weeks walking with this guy, a promise to be a Messiah the Lamb of God. And here you watch him enter the temple, make a, a whip out of cords, and start driving everybody out. Could, was there a sense of shock? What's going on? What's he doing? Or was it, had it become normal for them to sit and see these things taking place in the court of the Gentiles, taking place in the temple? It had just become so common that why would he do this? That's why I think John tells us in verse 17, his disciples remembered that it was written, zeal for your house will consume me. Zeal for your house will consume me. Now, zeal is not one of those words that we often use nowadays. Uh, we use things like passion, words like that. It gives us a picture, though, into what Jesus had here. A passion for the house of God. A passion for for a place of worship. And I think as we continue to go th through these things, we'll see that we too ought to, like Christ, have a passion for worship. But the focus of where that passion is supposed to be, I think we can learn something. Because in Jesus' response, I think he reveals his promise. Right? He's challenged here in verse 18. The Jews come and say, well, what authority, basically, is their question. What authority do you have? What sign do you give to do these things? Now, isn't it interesting that they don't seem to stop and evaluate their own hearts of, hey, have we really done something wrong here? They, they come and they just question Jesus, right? Well, give us a sign. 
You know, and if they were in some sense looking to just out Jesus, thinking he's a lunatic or something, they would have had reason to maybe do that. But, but there must have been an inkling to them that perhaps they recognized him as a man of God. And so they ask for this sign, and Jesus tells them, destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. Jesus is making a promise to them that, by the way, none of them understood in the moment. Nobody who heard that understood what Jesus was saying. The Jews were like, wait a second, we spent, we spent 46 years building this temple. How are you going to raise it up in three days? They don't understand what Jesus is saying. Neither do Jesus' disciples. It wasn't until later, after Jesus would raise from the dead, that they remembered this taking place. And can I just insert a little comment here, not as, a, not as a primary point of application, but isn't that true that sometimes when God's teaching us something, we don't understand it fully in the moment? That sometimes we need the context of God's greater work to understand what he's doing? Jesus is on the outset of his ministry. And here his disciples are seeing him destroy this temple. I'll raise it in three days. What on earth is he speaking about? But John, I love it. Uh, Bill, you, you mentioned the editorial notes, right? You, you gave some editorial notes in your class this morning. John gives us these editorial notes as he's recording this gospel. And we're thankful for those things because he's making sure we understand what's going on. That we don't have to wait until uh, who knows when to grasp what Jesus is saying. He's helping tie up those loose ends for us. So his editorial notes here. Uh, we can see it in verse 21. He says, but he is speaking about the temple of his body. He was speaking about the temple of his body. In other words, uh, what Jesus is doing is he is promising the fulfillment of the temple. That's what Jesus is getting at. And that, brothers and sisters, is I think what this passage is getting it. That's why John includes it. He doesn't just include it so that we would come to church and look and say, are, are we selling something in church? He's including it because he's revealing something about the inauguration of who Christ is, this new kingdom of God, that in Christ is the fulfillment of the temple. This is one of the reasons that I love the scriptures. I've come to cherish the Old Testament in ways that I never did before. Because I've come to see, and I think we have, as a church have come to see these things too, that when God instituted things in the old, he was pointing ahead to something that was to come in the new. There wasn't just randomness to God saying, uh, giving the directions about the tabernacle or the temple and how his people were supposed to worship and what was supposed to go on there, etc. Right? There was intentionality to that thing to be teaching and training his people to understand what was needed spiritually. And so Jesus comes on the scene and destroy this temple, his body, and he will raise it up in three days. He is promising something glorious. But what does it mean then? What does Jesus mean? What does the fulfillment of the temple mean in Jesus? Number one, we need to stop and uh, recognize what that, go back to what the temple meant to the Jews to understand what it means for Jesus to be the temple, right? That in Jesus as our temple, we have access to God. And we don't have just the same access that the Jews had. We have greater access because through Jesus, the new temple he doesn't just as the high priest go into the most holy place. As we learned in Hebrews, Jesus as our great high priest goes into the very presence of God, the very throne room of God. So the access that we have through our temple, Jesus, is far greater, so much more. That in 1 Kings we read that God's glory is seen in a room filled with smoke. But in Jesus, God's glory is on display in his whole person, his whole ministry. Everything that he's come to do, we get a full, radiant picture of God's glory. That in Jesus, our access to God is not limited to a specific place, but to a specific person. And this is why, brothers and sisters, the, uh, the mountaintop theology just doesn't work that we're all climbing the same mountain from different angles and that you pick your path and we'll all get to the same peak. It doesn't work this way because Jesus is the one temple. 
He is the one mediator. He is the one way to the Father. He is our access to God. That in Him, we are given this great opportunity. Secondly, Jesus being the fulfillment of the temple means that in Him, we have atonement for sin. What took place at the temple? This is the place where people would come to offer sacrifices. And interestingly enough, what, what feast was Jesus in Jerusalem to celebrate? Passover. The time where uh, they would come and, and offer a sacrifice in celebration of the Passover lamb. The lamb that stood in the place of their sins, in the gap for them. Jesus offers us an atonement unlike the sacrifices that were offered in the temple. But isn't it interesting that in Jesus is the ultimate sacrifice. That he doesn't go somewhere else. He doesn't bring a sacrifice in. He himself is the sacrifice. He would lay himself down, and he alludes to that, doesn't he? Destroy this temple. It's such an interesting thing there. He does, it, who's the one who would destroy that temple? Who are the ones who would destroy the body of Christ but the religious leaders of the day? You want to see a sign? You destroy this temple and I will raise it up in three days. There is a promise that Jesus gives here. He is looking at foreshadowing, foretelling his own suffering even. That in him is the atonement for sins. We don't look to a man. We don't bring our animals uh, to church on Sunday mornings because our sacrifice has been made in Christ. He is our atoning sacrifice. It is in Him that we worship. Jesus is the fulfillment of the temple. He is our temple. But lastly, in Jesus being the fulfillment of the temple, and honestly we could probably spend a lot more time on this, but Jesus was the affirmation of the Christ. This is, what, this is what Jesus is offering uh, to his people. That on that day, when the Lord would rise again, his disciples would remember what he said and be affirmed in their belief that he is the Messiah. But even in verse 17, his disciples, in seeing Jesus interact with the temple in this way, they're reminded of, that he is the Christ. The, maybe they thought back to uh, Zechariah 14.21. Which reads, and on that day there will no longer be a merchant in the house of the Lord God Almighty. Or maybe they thought back to Malachi 3. Then suddenly the Lord you are seeking will come to his temple. He will purify the Levites and refine them like gold and silver. This scene at the outset of Jesus' ministry both immediately and later confirmed for his disciples that he is the Christ. You want a sign, they say. Here's your sign. The resurrection. That if Jesus has the authority to raise up his own life, to raise up that ultimate sacrifice, surely he's the one who has authority in the house of God. He's the one who reigns over it. He's the one we are to worship and bow the knee to. And so John tells, tells us later in verse 23 that many of the people who were there in Jerusalem believed in Jesus because of the signs that he was doing. And it's kind of interesting because it says, but Jesus on his part did not entrust himself to them because he knew all people and he needed no one to bear witness about man, for he himself knew what was in man. Now, I don't think that what John is doing is condemning people for coming to believe in Christ because of his signs. Because isn't that the whole reason John's including all these signs, is so that we might believe? But I think what he's getting at and what Jesus understood is that these people were in it for the signs. They weren't in it for the Messiah. They were in it for the, the showmanship the awe and wonder of this guy who performs these signs. They, they wanted the miraculous. And, and I think there are many people today who were in it for all the same reasons. I remember even being at a Christian college. There was a large group of people that made such a focus on, on the spectacular, such a focus on seeking the Lord in huge ways, wanting to see miracles, all these things. And they would always go back to, if you're not seeing these things happen, perhaps you don't have enough faith. 
Perhaps you're not walking closely enough with God. See, it had become more about the miraculous, more about the signs, even for them today, that they were more focused on that than they were the Messiah himself. It was less about just worshiping God and more about manipulating him into doing some sort of sign and wonder. That's not worship. And Jesus makes it clear throughout his ministry, he makes it clear here that that's not what he's come to do. He does not come, and we learned it last week, he, wasn't, he doesn't come to be manipulated by the desires and passions and agendas of man. But he comes to do the will of the Father. And so as we come before the Lord, we look at these signs, and they should instill awe and wonder in us. They're meant to give us the evidence so that we may believe, but not just to believe in the signs, but to believe in the one who does them. That we would believe in Christ, that we would believe in him as the Son of God, that we would believe that, uh, of who he is, what he's come to do, that we would believe the scriptures, that we would believe the prophecies, we would recognize him as the true Messiah, and believe in him. That's how we respond to these things. Uh, who knows the amount of signs that Jesus had been doing? They were meant to instill belief in him. So my question to you today will be this. What will your response be to Jesus? What will your response be? What is your response to Jesus? Is he someone that's here in your life to, to help things go right? Someone you're trying to please to make life an ease? Or is Jesus somebody that you come to worship despite whatever your circumstances may be? That you've recognized him to be the fulfillment of the temple. That as our temple, he's the one that we're supposed to come to. He's the one we're supposed to worship. That He's the one who provides us access to the Father. That is our temple, that He is our atoning sacrifice to provide the forgiveness of sins. That we are invited to come to His temple openly, freely, not just uh, at a celebration of a feast or on a Sunday, but we, are, we can have access to His temple anytime, anywhere, because it's not about the place, it's about the person. If we're going to have reverence, and you want to go that route and say that John's passage here is all about just having a reverence and respect for the house of worship, then let me encourage you with this. Jesus is what the object of your reverence should be. This building may burn. This, bur this building will not stand forever. But the worship of God can still go on. Think of our brothers and sisters in Christ who don't have places like this to gather and worship. Our brothers and sisters in Christ who gather huddled in the corner of a basement in the dark with a flashlight to open the scriptures, to read and to worship together. That is as much a sanctuary as this room is. Because it's not about a building. It's about our new temple, Jesus, who came to replace the old with the new to transform it. So what is your reverence toward him? Is your zeal more focused on the building for church or is your zeal and passion focused on the temple of Jesus Christ? Do you find yourself mistreating Christ, manipulating Christ for your own purposes and your own desires? Do you find yourself in any way trying to create barriers or walls that would go up that would prevent other people from coming to Jesus. Let's tear those down. Let's come to the Lord and worship. Let's be a church that respects and honors not just a building, but the temple of Jesus Christ, the one who came to make that sacrifice, the one who came to raise himself up from the dead, the one who came to give us access to God in a whole new way. Let's not just worship in a temple of Village Bible Church, but worship in a temple of our glorious Lord and Savior.